had a pretty early flight in, and when the first started, I have to say, Deacon Harold was pretty tired. He was a pretty exhausted, and the start of the launch was fairly subdued. And that's okay. I can understand that. I've been tired on flights as well. But then we started to talk about men's ministry. Then we started to talk about Jesus Christ. And then we started talking about how we can draw men back into the church. And as the conversation went on, Deacon Harold became more and more animated to the point where I thought, frankly, we were going to have half the restaurant was going to be joining us at our table. Deacon Harold loves Jesus Christ, and he loves the men that Christ has called to his side. And the two things that he told me about himself is that, first off, he used to be in a jazz band, right, when you were in college, which doesn't surprise me. But what did surprise me was that his favorite band is Queen, which I never would have guessed, never would have guessed that at all. But two favorite scriptures. The first scripture he said was 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, which is simply God is love. And whoever remains in God remains in his love. And that makes sense to me. That makes sense for me for, for Deacon Harold. The way that he became animated, talking about men and talking about men's ministry, talking about the young men and how we draw the men back to the church. But then I had to look up the second one. It was Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. And when I read it, this makes sense for me as well. And I would strongly advise, if you wanted to pick a favorite verse, this is a good one. God indeed is my Savior. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. God indeed is my Savior. I am confident and not afraid. My stronghold and my courage is the Lord. That, men, is a fantastic scripture for each and every one of us. So, without further ado, I'm going to ask you men to extend holy hands, just as Paul uh, taught his disciples and he teaches us today. And we're going to pray over our, our brother, Deacon Harold. Lord God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would come mightily upon Deacon Harold, that you would allow him, Lord, to speak with a spirit of boldness, that you would allow him, Lord, to proclaim your word in clarity, that it would penetrate deep within our hearts, and that you would allow him, Lord, to glorify you by his words and by his actions this day and every day for the rest of his life. And all of God's men said, amen and amen. Brothers, Deacon Harold. And so we first have to talk about evangelization. It's the buzzword today, evangelization. What does the word actually mean? It comes from a Greek word, evangelion, which means good news. And it was used a couple hundred years before Jesus at the time of Homer for soldiers when they came back from battle. We have evangelion. We have good news. We won. It was also used the same way with the Romans at the time of Jesus. Of course, it was evangelium in the Latin, which also meant good news. Except when Caesar proclaimed news. Because news from the king wasn't just good news, it was news that could change your life. Well, men of God, we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So the encounter with Jesus Christ is not just good news, it is life-changing news. Because news from our king can and will change your life. But your life can't be changed if you're not first joyful in the Lord. Now, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is merely external. The joy of the Lord is internal. And it's that joy of the Lord that leads to external happiness. You know, St. Paul says it best. If you have your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now, the word he uses here in Greek is sarx, and sarx has two meanings. It means what Jesus said in John chapter 6 when he said, eat my flesh.
flesh, right? You know, you, uh, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. So it means flesh on the bone, or it could mean earthly things, worldly things. And that's how Paul is using it here. So he says, for those who live according to the flesh, or live according to the world, set their minds on the things of the world. If you're worldly, you're going to focus your life on the world. Makes sense. But those who live according to the Spirit, according to the mind and heart of God, set their mind, uh, live according to the Spirit. Makes sense. Here's the key. To set the mind on the flesh is death. So the word death in Hebrew is mavet. It just doesn't mean physical death. It means to cut yourself off from the life of God. Man, let that sink in for a second. Death means to cut yourself off from God's life. That is worse than death. Because even after death, you have two choices, don't you? Smoking and non-smoking, right? Come on. So Paul says to set the mind on the flesh, to focus your life on the things of the world, will cut you off from God. But to set the mind on the spirit, on the things of God, is life and peace. And that's where the joy comes from. When we focus our lives on the things of God, then we will have life and then we will have peace. But brothers, the problem is that Satan don't want us to have peace. He don't want us to have life. He wants us in hell with him. Now, here's how Satan tries to take away our joy. There's an interesting parallel between Genesis chapter 3 and Luke chapter 4. And here in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we see the temptation. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, mm, sin going to taste good. And you parallel that with Luke chapter 4, where Jesus is tempted by Satan. Remember the first temptation. If you are the son of God, command these loaves to be uh, bread, these stones to become bread. So see the first temptation, Satan, food. Second temptation, first temptation, Jesus, food. So Satan tries to satisfy our hunger and thirst for truth and goodness and beauty with that which does not satisfy. That's the lie. He, see, Satan is the one I think that came up with the word recycling. Right? Because the same thing he did here in Genesis chapter 3, he tried the same thing with Jesus and he tried the same thing with us. So that's the first temptation. To do what feels good. It's in those times that we're angry with someone that we love. When we're struggling with depression or addiction or abuse. When we're tempted to do what feels good at the expense of our dignity and self-worth. When it's easier to live a lie than to face the truth. That's when we make room in our hearts for Satan to come in and take over. That's why a lot of you are, have problems with pornography. Yes, we're weak, sinful human beings, amen. But women are not objects for pleasure and gratification. I was in law enforcement for 23 years and a police chief for 11 of those years. And I'm telling you, I am very familiar with human trafficking. Pornography fuels human trafficking. So next time you're playing with yourself while you're looking at the porn, you are helping to exploit women and children. That's what you're doing. You are the cause of human trafficking. You're a slave and a whore of Satan when you look at porn. You want to break free from slavery? Then get free. Christ has given us weapons to fight. Eucharistic adoration. The rosary. Those are weapons against the forces of sin, death, and hell in our lives. The second temptation here. So the tree was good for food, and it was del a delight to the eyes. Oh, 
sin looks good. What's the second temptation of Jesus? The devil took him on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Look, look at all the splendor and glory of the world, Jesus. And he said, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. So second temptation, look at the light, look at all the delights that you get when you sin. Second temptation of the devil to Jesus. Look at all the, if you, all you have to do is fall down and worship me. So what he's talking about here is focusing our lives on worshiping the things of the world. Now if I said, if you want your kids to come back from the church who are away from the church, Jesus says we have to fast and pray. Everybody's praying, nobody's fasting. Now, we are horrible, horrible as Catholics as, as far as fasting goes. Think about it. How many fasting days do we have in Lent? How many days do we fast in Lent? Some say seven. No, okay, here's the thing. Fridays are abstinence days. That means you don't eat meat. Those aren't fasting days. There's only one. Ash Wednesday. Good Friday is not in Lent. Remember, Lent ends with the start of the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. That starts the shortest church season of the year, the Triduum. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. We have one fasting day in Lent. Our Muslim brothers and sisters for Ramadan fast every day. So we got a lot of work to do. The thing is, we could get creative with fasting. For example... You don't have to fast from food, right, which is, which is good, fasting from food. But you get creative. How about fasting from something that you enjoy? Like, for example, if you want your kids to come back to the church, you're praying for them, but are you fasting for them? So you may want to add a fast. For example, I am going to fast from watching the Steelers for a month. Oh, see, look, see, I, I'm, everybody was like, I'm with you, Deacon, until you said that. Because, oh, deacon, you're asking a lot. Oh, deacon, I, I, I can't go without looking at my stillers for a month. What do you, what do you, deacon, what are you saying? Really? Imagine if Jesus said that before he went to the cross. This is too much. Uh, you're asking me to do that? So not watching TV for four weeks as a fast to unite with your prayer for your child? That's too much? See? Who's your daddy? That's what Satan is saying. Third temptation in Genesis. Good for food, delight to the eyes. The tree was desired to make one wise. I'm going to be like God. What's the third temptation of Jesus? If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will... Have angels charge of you, and on their hands it will bear you up as you strike your foot against the stone. So, if you show me your God, jump off this thing, because if you're God, huh? You will be like God. That's the third temptation. What does that voice sound like today, especially for our young men who are struggling to find faith in Jesus Christ? Who says some white guy in Rome? When a beanie on his head who's never been married can tell me what to do with my body. Who says I have to go to church every Sunday? I can worship God any way that I want. See, we worship the Trinity of me, myself, and I. And we stop worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We stop worshiping the God of our salvation. So we put our trust in the things of the world, and we don't put our trust in God. So how do we recover the joy when Satan is trying to kill the life of God in us? One of the ways that I would argue, my men, is to say, the relation, understand the relationship between truth and freedom. If we understand what real truth is and what real freedom is against this culture, then we will begin to find our joy. What do I mean by that? So when we leave at the end of Mass, the deacon kicks you out. Ite misa est. Go. She is sent. Because the church is always referred to as she as the bride of Christ. 
Go and set to do what? To be Eucharist to the world. We just received Jesus Christ and the holy sacrifice of the mass in word and in sacrament. We've received them twice at every mass. I get sick and tired of people saying, I left the Catholic Church and I wasn't being fed. That's because you're looking for junk food. You ain't going to find that here. You are fed and nourished by the word of God. That's why the word comes first, which prepares our hearts, our minds, and our souls to then receive him again, body, blood, soul, divinity, and the Eucharist. After receiving our Lord and word and sacrament, we are then sent forth to be Eucharist to the world, to tell somebody about Jesus. That's our task by our baptism. You don't have to be a theologian or ordained. By our baptism, we are called to be prophets. A prophet is one who speaks the word of God, and that's what we're called to do. Empowered by the sacraments, we are going forth to share our faith with boldness and conviction. That's what we're called to do. That's what true evangelization with the joy of the Lord is all about. So truth and freedom. So we walk out of the church because, you know, the battle is not inside here. The battle is out there where they're trying to tell you that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Where they're trying to tell you that a child in a womb is a blob of tissue, not a person. Where they're trying to tell you that marriage is something else other than one man and one woman and any children they have together. Which is the heart, the soul, the center, the foundation, the nucleus of civilization, culture, and society. Where they're trying to tell you that old people are worthless. If you're old and you're sick, you're a burden on your family, you're a burden on the health care system, you're a burden on society. We'll give you two choices. We'll kill you, euthanasia, or we'll give you medication to kill yourself, assisted suicide. That's what we're up against. That's how Satan's trying to kill God's life in us right now, every day. How do we confront that? So we have, we have two choices. We walk out of church, we have our faith, and we have the culture. Which voice you going to listen to? But right, let, let's, let's understand the relationship between truth and freedom. Let's look at truth in our faith and in our culture. So we leave church and we walk out. What is the culture saying to us? Let, let's step into the culture. We, we walk outside of church, we step back into our culture, Back into the high schools, the universities, which, by the way, many universities, they're now indoctrination centers. They're not teaching young people how to think. They're teaching young people what to think. So you need to think twice before sending your kids to college. Or even Catholic schools. Let's be real. If they ain't teaching the Catholic faith, don't waste your money. Don't waste it. If they're not, te all, they're, all you're paying for is a very expensive public school. But here we are. What does the culture say every day to you and your children about truth? Truth is relative. Truth, in other words, truth is whatever I decided to be. We even have cultural affirmations for it, don't we? That may be true for you. That's not true for me. That may be your truth, but that's not my truth or my personal favorite. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. What, what is that? See, we live in a culture where truth is like Play-Doh. Remember Play-Doh? You bought your kids some Play-Doh. You open the can and you can, you can stretch and twist that Play-Doh. That's what the truth is in our culture. We can stretch and twist the truth into any shape that I want it to be. That's very dangerous. Jesus warns us about this. Remember, he said, if you, if you don't follow me and my word, you will be like the man who builds his house on sand. The winds came, the rains came, and washed that house away. We need to be building our lives on, the, Jesus, on a solid ground, on solid land. Right? So the winds came, the rains came, and that house stood strong and firm. This relativism of the culture, truth, whatever I want, that's building your house on sand. 
Because when the winds of transgenderism and the winds of moral relativism and the winds of same-sex uh, so-called marriage, of course it's not marriage at all, and when all, and all these euthanasia, abortion, all these things come at you, what happens? We cave in and we give up and we stop talking. We stop saying things. Priests stop preaching about it at mass because it's too hard or people might complain. When lives can be saved, when souls can be changed, we're afraid, we're cowards when it comes to sharing our faith when it's hard. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He wants to keep your damn mouth shut and don't say anything and let this culture run roughshod over us. And then we whine and complain about who's the president and who's in Congress. Who's a, you want to look, you want to see the blame? Look in the mirror! You want to see the solution? Look in the mirror. We have to get away from this. This is doing nothing but helping to kill God's life in us. So truth. Let's look at truth in our faith. Let's step into our holy Catholic faith. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the and the life. So truth is not an idea you form in your mind. Truth is not a philosophical construct. Truth is a person. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is truth itself. And when we're living in a dynamic relationship with the living God, when we're living in his truth, what does he guarantee us that that truth will do? The truth will do what? Set us free to do what? To become the man who God created and calls each one of us to be. That's the truth. Truth will set us free. Let's look at freedom now. Let's step back into the culture. Now, what does the culture have to say to us every day about freedom? I'm free to do whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want, to whomever I want. And if you don't let me do whatever I want to do, I'm going to call you names. Let me tell you some of the names I've been called. You're bigoted. You're closed-minded. You're homophobic. You don't appreciate diversity. Even from black Catholics, you're a house nigger Catholic. You're an Uncle Tom Catholic. What the, hell, what the hell does that mean? That I'm not, what, I don't even know what that means. I am a loyal son of the church. I teach the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. I teach the faith that the martyrs died for. Those martyrs died rather than deny Jesus. They died rather than deny Jesus. That's what I preach and that's what I teach. So call, look, why do they call you names? Here's why they call you names. They got no argument. The reason why they call you names, because they want you so full of emotion, that he called me that, that you don't think. That's why I love being Catholic, because we're a thinking church. We use the mind and the heart, both. Not just all this, because all this, if you have too much of this, it becomes emotionalism. You have to use the mind and the heart, both. So freedom, do, and what happens? Freedom, you become enslaved. Th that's the ironic thing about cultural freedom. You become enslaved to the very things that you think make you free, that you think make you happy, that you think make you fulfilled. You become a slave to it. What about freedom in our faith? Let's step back in our one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. Jesus says in John's gospel, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That authentic freedom is rooted in the obedience of faith. It's listening to the voice of God and allowing that voice to change our lives. Men, when our will, our wants, our needs, our hopes, our desires, our dreams are in communion with God's will, God's will and my will are one, now you are truly free. That is authentic freedom. That's 
when you truly become the man who God created you to be. Let me put it to a little more visually. Um, let's just say there's a violin on the podium, right? Because you heard I'm, I play guitar in a jazz band, so I love using music analogies. So there, there, there's a, a, a violin on the string over there, right? A violin over on, on the podium here. Now, a violin has four strings. Now, the culture would look at that violin and say what? That string on that violin, that string is not free. Look how tight it's wound around the body of the violin. The violin is controlling that string with its rules and commandments and catechisms and moral codes. That string is so tight, it can't do anything. It's not free. So what the culture do? Do whatever you want. So it would take, go to the tuning peg, whoop, 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 loosen that string, pull off the tuning peg, off the nut, off the fretboard, off the bridge, and lay the string down next to the violin. And now the culture would say, oh, thank you. Now that string is free. It's no longer controlled by the commandments and moral codes of the violin. The string is now free to do whatever it wants. But I ask you, men of God, what is that string now free to do? Nothing! It's completely useless! And if we continue to live our lives as this truth is whatever I want and freedom is whatever I want, we're going to live a life of that string. A life of emptiness, of uselessness, of nothingness. I'll prove it to you. Um, sir, here, blue shirt. What kind of car you drive? Hmm? Mitsubishi Lancer. Okay, I don't know a ton about cars. H how old is that car, sir, if you don't mind me asking? 17 years old. It's a, oh, that's, that's a reliable car. It gets you back and forth the way you need to go. Thank you, Jesus. That's why you're so miserable. You, look, we're, look, this Monroeville, man, you got to get yourself a drop-top Ferrari, man. With the Bose speaker system in it. With you, so when you got your Ray-Bans, you put that traffic light out there on a beautiful day like today. The ladies can see you. you that, that kicker speaking, that, that system is kicking. Boom, 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 boom. And you're like, yeah. That will make you happy. What's wrong with you? How many of you amazing men of God own a house? Thank you, Jesus. Brother, how big is your house? You'll mind me asking you, sir. About 2,500. This is a pretty good sized house. Thank you, Jesus. That's why you're so miserable. You got to add another 3,000 square foot addition onto your house. Where are you going to put your boat? What's wrong with you? That's why you're so miserable. Good Lord. How many of you amazing men of God have children? Thank you, Jesus. How many of you have more than four children? Oh, wonderful. How many children you got, sir? Yeah, how many children do you have? Seven? Thank you, Jesus. Seven is a lucky number. What a blessing it is to the church and to the world. Thank you, Jesus. That's why you're so miserable. First of all, you are why the earth is dying. Because you push out all those children that are eating all that food and uh, uh, breathing all the oxygen out of the air. And they're putting global footprints all over the place. You are why the earth is dying. And not only that, your wife, after pushing out seven kids, she's sagging a little bit, bro. You got to get, get some surgery, get some things back up there again. Or how about this, get yourself a little side action, bro, right? <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean any disrespects, but isn't that the culture's answer? More, 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 bigger, better. Why? Because you're not good enough the way you are. Your life is determined by your possessions. Your life is determined by how others see you. You don't care what God thinks. You care what other people think about you. And that's why we're afraid to evangelize effectively. Effectively evangelize. Because we're too worried about what other people think about us. I don't give a damn what people think about me. Because I have to stand before Jesus Christ. He has given all of us men talents. Remember the parable of the talents? 
He gave some guy like four, another guy two, another guy one. How many talents you got? It don't matter. It matters what you do with what you've been given. I ain't going to be that guy that stands before Almighty God. And he just, you know what he's going to say? He's going to go, okay, deacon, where are my talents back? What would you do with what I gave you? Where's my tenfold, fiftyfold, hundredfold return on the investment I made in you? I gave you three talents. I gave you the gift of diaconate. I gave you the gift of fatherhood. I gave you the gift of being a husband. Why aren't your children here with you? Where's the, well, Lord, it's like this. I was afraid that if I spoke out boldly in love, the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, we have to speak the truth, but it always has to be in love. I was afraid if I did that, well, people may not like me. I was afraid that people will send letters to the bishop complaining about something I said. I was afraid about what people would say about me and maybe, you know, I, I, and Jesus said, wait a minute. Let me see if I've got this straight. I was beat half to death by scourging. Then I carried the instrument of my own death up a hill. Then I died on that hill for three hours for you, being spat on and punched and kicked and mocked the entire time, and you couldn't take when somebody called you a name because you weren't afraid to stand up for your faith? How dare you call yourself a Catholic? You know what you are? A coward! And you spit on the graves of all those courageous men and women that died so you can have the faith you have today. I ain't going to be that guy. I'm going to say, Jesus, you know what? I just tried to be faithful to you. I, I mean, every once in a while, I'll get an email or something with the fruits, but I, I don't know. Jesus said, let me show you. And he stands back. You see all those people there? They're here because of the seeds you planted in their hearts. Because you weren't afraid to speak the truth in love. Because you took some beatings verbally, you know, I, I, was just, I was just telling Matt Leonard that I spoke, I'm not going to say what state this is, <laughs> but I spoke in a state recently, where I, and I spoke the truth in love. I talked to a group of great uh, uh, middle school kids. I said, marriage is a man and a woman, child and a woman is a person, boys are actually males and girls are actually females. And I received, and the kids loved, they're like, when are you coming back? Oh, some of the parents up there and some of the teachers, I received the most hateful, spiteful emails I've ever received in 20 years as, as a deacon. It hurt. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It hurt to read that stuff. But I also said, thank you, Jesus. Because if I can experience at least a little bit what those martyrs did, and, I, and God's not asking me to die. He's asking me to die to my pride. He's asking me to live in humility, because what is true humility? Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. That's what God's asking us to do. Now, we would say, as Catholics, looking at that violin string, that string is not free. It can't do anything. So what would we do? We would go walk back over to the violin, take the string, put it on the bridge, over the fretboard, over the nut, back into the tuning peg, and then we would tune it. What tunes that string? The catechism, the scriptures, the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Those things exist to tune, because we're each the string. And those, and our, the teachings of our church tune us to the perfect pitch for which we were created. And when we allow the church to tune us, then we become free. Th think about this for a second. And, and, and that, that practice of tuning and living in accord with our faith, that's called virtue. For, for example, let's take an Olympic athlete, right? Let's take um, Michael Phelps, who won all those medals for swimming. Now, if he were to go, I want to be one of the greatest swimmers of all time in Olympic history. 
I'm going to go to a, my coach. He goes to the secular culture. Coach, I want to be the greatest swimmer ever. Well, Mike, here's what you got to do. Just come to swim and practice whenever you, you feel like it. Eat whatever you want. Eh, don't hit the weights or go to the gym or do cardio or do any of that stuff. Just, you know, just call me whenever you want to practice and just like, make it happen. Is that what he did? Or did he do this? I want to be one of the greatest swimmers ever. And the coach told him, you want to be great? Mike, it means sacrifice. It means you have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning every day. It means you have to do the road work. You have to hit the gym. You have to hit the pool. Then if you're in co college and taking class, you go to school. Then after, you do another three hours in the pool. That means you can't hang out with your friends whenever you want. You can't eat whatever you want. It's like you have to have a strict diet for what you put into your body so you can maximize your, your output. Mike, that also means you can't play video games. You, have, you, have to, you, you can't, you know, maybe even miss your, your best friend's birthday. You have to miss, you have to miss. This is what you have to do, Mike. Now, what did he say? Did he say, nah, forget it. I'll just go. What person who wants to be great ever does that? They don't do that. They are willing to sacrifice in order to be great. That's what virtue is in our church. Holy Mother Church is the coach. You can't, I mean, here. Having sex before you're married takes it out of its proper context of covenant relationship with the living God. We don't look at women as objects for our pleasure and gratification. So that's why we don't, we don't hit it and quit it or bang that chick or tap that ass. That, that's the language of the culture. That's not, that's not who we are, man of God. It also means alcohol is not a problem. But getting drunk with your friends and hanging out and doing drugs, that kind of stuff, that's not who we are as men. That's not what it means to be a follower of Christ. So you have to, you have to sacrifice that. Why don't we teach the faith that way to our young people? Why don't they see that virtue is something that our heart actually desires? It means sacrifice. It does. But we have those sacrifices in order to make us great. In order to make us great. That's why those sacrifices are there. It's not because I have to go to Mass on Sunday. God is literally giving us his life in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Let me give you a couple real-world examples of how this works. Of this joy of the Lord that leads to evangelization. I'm going back to Australia in two weeks. When I was there on one of my uh, trips, this is I think 2018 or 17, before the whole that pan pandemic garbage, I gave a talk at a very large Maronite church. There were 700 or 800 people that were standing room only. The Maronite Bishop of Australia was there in the front row with all his priests sitting next to him. During this talk, I talked about the theology of femininity and women. And I thought how we as Catholics have the best theology of women out of all the faiths that are out there. I'm not saying the other ones are bad. I just think we have the best. And as I was speaking, I, 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 was, I gave examples from Hindu from Buddhism, and from Islam. Now, I've read the Quran, and one of the surat from the Quran says that if you believe a woman did something wrong, you could strike her. Now, it doesn't say you have to see her do it. You don't have to have evidence. You just have to believe something, and you can hit her. Now, when I said that, a Muslim young man stood up. He had, I knew he was a Muslim. He had a kufi on. He said, no, you misrepresent Islam. I was like, whoa, hold on. The Maronite bishop was like looking back. Who's that back there? And I was like, oh, man. So I said, okay, you know what, sir? I apologize. I said, just like I don't want anybody misinterpreting our scriptures, I don't want to misinterpret your scriptures. What does it actually say? He said, you need English. You must need Arabic. I said, you're correct, sir. I read the Quran in English, although it was considered the best English translation by all the imams. But you're right. I don't read Arabic. You do. Can you please tell us what it says? He said, you don't have to hit her that hard. People started laughing like you just did, and he got angry. So now I'm thinking, I, I need to get a control of this thing before I lose the whole thing. I said, you know what, sir? I have to finish this talk. 
Let's do this. I'm going to ask you two questions right now. If you can answer these questions for me, I will stop the talk and continue to engage you. If you can't answer these questions, then please, sir, please sit down, and I promise I will talk to you for as long as you want afterwards. He thought about it for a second. He said, I said, thank you, sir. I appreciate that very much. Now, in the Quran, which, again, I apologize for reading in English, it says that Jesus, who's considered a much lesser prophet than Muhammad, Jesus does miracles, Muhammad does none. So tell me how Jesus, uh, how Muhammad could be more powerful than Jesus when in your holy book, Jesus does miracles, Muhammad does none. That's my first question. My second question is this. The only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran is Miriam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's spoken of with great respect. Muhammad's mother nor any of his wives, including his favorite wives, Fatima and Khadija, are not mentioned at all in the Quran. The only woman mentioned by name is the mother of Jesus Christ. I said, tell me how Muhammad can be more powerful than Jesus when Jesus' mother is mentioned and Muhammad's mother and wives are not. And he sat down. I, I ignored it, continued the rest of the talk. I looked for him afterward. But he wasn't there. And the reason I told you that story is to share this with you. I received an email shortly after an engagement that said this. This was like four or five months afterwards. I'd just like you to know that when my daughter and husband went to a talk of yours in Sydney, they took a friend with them who was a non-practicing Muslim. So this mom, my daughter, my husband went with, and my daughter invited a friend who was Muslim, but he wasn't practiced. That means that the young man saw the exchange between me and the other gentleman. After your talk, he bought 13 of your other talks, came home, downloaded them onto his phone, and has listened to them on his way to work and back. At the present moment, he is preparing to receive instruction in the Catholic faith. Praise the Lord and God bless you for coming and sharing your faith so powerfully. What's that got to do with me? Nothing. We talked about music. We're just the instrument. God's the musician. And what we have to be, men, is finely tuned instruments in God's hands. That's all the joy of the Lord is about. Helping us to become finely tuned instruments so that God can use us for his honor and his glory. Finally. Where do I begin? Thank you for saying yes to our Lord and for being a true voice for Christ. I was worried about my Protestant friends I, to the, I brought to the men's conference in Columbus. I was worried that they would feel alienated and possibly insulted and annoyed with me. What happened was the exact opposite. I just got a text from my friend who was raised Catholic, but after a family tragedy stopped going to church. He never felt at home in his new church, and when he heard you appreciated your candor, and truth. He asked me, how do I get back to the Catholic Church? Can you remind me how to do reconciliation? I don't know what happened, but I believe God wants me back in the Catholic Church. My other friend never had much religious background. He had been wandering and searching for 17 years. He sat there in the crowd, frantically going through his Bible as you explained the reconciliation and Holy Mass. He leaned into me and said, I don't want to cry but I finally understand what you mean about the sacraments. Do you mind if I come with you to the Easter Vigil Mass? I want to see people take the Eucharist for the first time. Now again, what's that got to do with me? Nothing. I'm the instrument, God's the musician. Men of God, when you leave this conference, continue to find the joy of the Lord. I'm asking you to do two very simple things, two things. First of all, Go to the Heroic Men website. I am part of an organization with Father Larry Richards and many others called the Catholic Men's Leadership Alliance. We created the best resources for Catholic men on the planet. That is not an exaggeration. It's basically formed for men. You, every, if you want 
to videos, if you want audio talks, if you want resources, you, you, uh, I'm not sure how to pray. We've got, pray. We've got everything that you can imagine and more resources for men for free. Available to each and every one of you. Heroicmen.com, go to that website and utilize those resources. Second, after you leave here, you may be pumped up and excited, but the devil's going to try and take away your joy. Go to a men's group. That man is you. Or what, go on a retreat. You're starting to have the Emmaus retreats here. Go right here, right? The Emmaus guys right here. Talk to one of these dudes in the white shirts. And they're not from the loony bin, by the way, the white shirt guys. Are, but, but no, seriously, I, I, tell you, I guarantee you, my friends, retreats are not about let's hold hands and sing kumbaya and get in touch with my feminine side. That's garbage. That's not a retreat. This will help you to grow more deeply in love with Jesus Christ and grow as a man of God. That's why every single one of you need to go. Just the two simple things. And I guarantee you, God will begin to work more powerfully in your life. And so, men of God, wrap it up here. Mark Twain, one of the great American writers, said the two greatest days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. I'm challenging you to allow your one holy, catholic, and apostolic faith to find that joy that leads to effective evangelization. Let Holy Mother Church give you your why. Amen. God bless you, brothers. Thank you. Not bad. I started about five minutes ago. You're good. You're good. You're good.